Good afternoon. Um, welcome to what is the seventh uh, WCAI Research Opportunity Webinar. Um, I'm really excited today to bring you bring to you what I think is a really unique uh, unique data set. Um, as most of you know by now, uh, what we do in these webinars is describe a data set to you um, that's available by proposal. Um, let me tell you a little bit about why I think you should submit a proposal. Um, of course, you're going to get access to a very unique data set if, you're, um, if your proposal is awarded. But we also try to keep it an efficient process from your perspective. So um, the proposals will be due in about three weeks from now. I've got the due date at the end of the webinar. Um, you'll have data in hand about four to six weeks from now, um, which is really you know, much better than if you were calling around asking companies for data yourself. A lot of work has um, gone on behind the scenes to make sure this data set is you know, absolutely ready to go for research. Um, we can help you with cleaning and data preparation beyond kind of where the data is now. We organize conference calls with the corporate sponsors so that uh, you can meet with them and talk to them about what you're working on. And then um, about a year from now, we'll have a private symposium here at Wharton where you'll be able to share your research uh, findings with the corporate partner. Um, as well as uh, post any papers you have on our SSRN working paper series. So it, it's really been a, a wonderful program so far. Uh, as I said, this is our seventh research opportunity program, and there's actually six more in planning right now uh, for next year, this fall and next year. So um, it's just been a remarkable program, and, and everyone who's been involved, the over 200 scholars who've been involved in the program right now have had fairly good experience. So um, I look forward to reading your proposal. Let me start by uh, telling you a little bit about the company that donated this data. And they are going to be anonymous today for the webinar. Um, but if you are awarded the data, you will, we will let you know what category uh, the product actually is. And, and you'll probably um, be able to figure out what, what the company is. You won't be able to talk about that company in any potential publications. You won't be able to use their name or their brand. Um, but you will have access to that just so that you can uh, do the best research possible. Um, to, with me today, I have uh, two, three folks from the company. The first is the head of marketing, um, and that's Jed, uh, as well as um, Sean, who heads up analytics. Uh, and they're the head of marketing and the head of analytics for one of the brands that we're going to talk about today, actually, Brand C. Um, and then as well as there's a third person on the line, that's Hari, and Hari is from the central um, data group uh, that handles, um, handles data for all three brands. So they're here to answer questions. Um, to kick things off, I asked Jed to tell us a little bit about the company and kind of their philosophy so you have, you have a sense of what they're all about. Do you want to take it from here, Jed? Sure. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, so as you can see on the slide here, uh, we've got a, a few details about uh, our company. But first, I, I wanted to say how excited we are to partner with both the Wharton team in addition to all of you, uh, just taking a quick look through the audience, there's some fantastic universities and companies listed, uh, and so we're really excited to have this opportunity to work with you all. Uh, we've put a lot of time into the data, as Ellie mentioned, and so uh, there's been a lot of work uh, both on our side from an infrastructure perspective as well as from a curation uh, perspective. And so I think we've got some really interesting stuff, and, and you're going to find some great stuff in there. Uh, really quickly, we're a major specialty retailer. We're based out of the United States. Uh, we operate in three distinct channels, so uh, retail, online, e-commerce, and then we have catalogs. And each of the brands that you're going to get a chance to work with are really independently managed. We all have our own marketing teams. Uh, we all have our own merchandising teams. And uh, although the brands do cooperate and, uh, and communicate and collaborate uh, at, at different levels uh, within their organizations, we all do march to our own drum beats and, and kind of move independently. Uh, one of the brands has a loyalty program. The other two do not. Uh, and then from a product perspective, uh, each of the product lines are different. Um, and then lastly, uh, the brand, uh, uh, each brand has its own stores and, and physical footprint. And in some cases, uh, we may end up near each other, uh, but in many cases, we're not. Uh, and then for the most part, the data that you're going to get to interact with is North American data. Um, and, and that's it for me. Uh, I'm going to uh, pass it back to you, Ellie. Um, great. Uh, thanks very much, Deb. Um, I was actually asked Sean uh, to tell you a little bit about the CRM systems uh, 
that the company has put together um, a little bit about all the work that's gone into it. I don't think academics kind of fully appreciate the, you know, the amount of effort that goes into um, collecting and, as Jed said, curating this data to make sure that it, it's very clean. Um, you want to talk a little bit more about that, Sean? Yeah, definitely. So, um, as as has been mentioned, you know, a tremendous amount of work um, went into went into this project over the course of uh, the last two or three years across uh, all three brands that you'll have access to the data for. And uh, what you're looking at right now are sort of the central pieces of what um, uh, the information that's in the data set. It's not it's not the uh, it's not 100 percent of what's in the data set, but it's the central pieces of what we the activities we look to link to our customers. So um, the advances we've made in the last few years have allowed us to to get sort of a single view of a customer um, across uh, multiple purchase points. So um, in store uh, for each of the brands, uh, online uh, direct purchases, telephone and, and online. Um, again, specific to each of the uh, the brands we'll be looking at, um, and, and be able to create uh, that that view of the same customer uh, purchasing in store that purchased online. In addition, what we're able to do is uh, match our outbound marketing activities. So uh, the ones you see here, direct mail, uh, catalog mailings, and emails are primarily the channels that we'll use outbound, uh, but these are, uh, we are, we're able to track this again back to that same sort of individual ID that, um, that reaches across all these channels. And then for, uh, for each of the brands, you'll also see web activity from, from our, known, our known customers, um, and that includes just visits to the website and, or the websites um, and the particular pieces and categories that uh, the customers interacted with, but then we also have information on product reviews, um, which is uh, something that's very interesting and it's, it, it's, uh, it's an area that uh, I, I know there's a lot of interest in understanding how product reviews uh, uh, influence, influence our customers, so that information is, is included as well. So th those are sort of three basic areas of purchasing, outbound marketing, and web activity. Um, again, not 100% of what you'll see in the data set, but definitely areas that uh, um, we're, we're proud of being able to, to link those all together and gives us an opportunity to, um, to do a lot of uh, good work and hopefully uh, we'll see a lot of good proposals based around these ideas. Great. So the, the, the general idea is that um, customers are assigned an ID and then as much as possible every interaction that the customer has, um, you know, all the kind of key events that they have, um, are tracked throughout the system. I wanted to um, give people a sense of more specifically how that happens. So, um, you know, it's not like the company has little spies following around each customer. Um, they collect data about the customers in the normal course of doing business, and then as much as possible, when those events occur, occur they try to match them back to existing customers in the CRM system. So for some types of events, that's very easy. Um, the customer ID is known. When you send a catalog to a specific customer ID, you know that that event occurred and that that was associated with that customer ID because you were kind of driving the process. Um, but there are kinds of events where the customer ID is unknown, um, and in those cases, the company does their best job to match that back to an existing customer based on what they would know, what information they have gathered during the event. So if you make an online purchase, you have to type in a ship to name and an address. So we can use that information to try to match you back to another customer who's already in the database. Um, for an in-store purchase, if you present a loyalty card, that loyalty card number identifies you. Um, also, if you didn't have a loyalty card, you, the clerk might ask you for your email, and that email, so we know that you made this purchase, and this is your email, we try to match you back to an existing customer in the database. So they're doing as much as possible to, to match those customer events back without kind of radically changing what is a fairly typical retail purchase process. Um, so it's not like a club where you have to join. So we, we can't match every single purchase back because we don't have everybody sort of uh, showing their club cards. But as much as possible, they match them back. Of course, some events don't get matched back. Um, but they are maintained in the database, and they will be included in the research data um, basically under anonymous customer IDs. So if someone comes in and makes a cash purchase at a physical store and doesn't identify themselves in any way, that gets rec recorded as kind of there as, you know, that's assigned a new customer ID because we can't match it to any existing customer. Or if I were to sign up for an email newsletter without a name, I'd continue to be tracked by that email. And then if, you know, later on down the road, I show up and purchase in the store and give that email address, now we've got a name. Um, they kind of populate that record as much as they can from what they've seen so far. And that's just, I, I'm sorry to take a bit of time with that, but I want to make sure everyone understands how the measurement system works because it can explain a lot um, 
about whether or not uh, the customer, you know, what we can and cannot track basically for individual customers. It's, we can track anything that you could sort of reasonably track in a normal retail process. Um, we had a question come in, which is, um, do we have records of a web visit even if there is no purchase? I'm going to get to that a little bit later, but in fact, we do have records of web visits even when a purchase wasn't made, but subject to this matching thing. So if somebody just visits anonymously the website and doesn't ever give their name, it can't be linked back to an existing customer record. Hopefully that makes some sense. Um, let me talk to you, to you about how we sampled from the database. So we are not giving you the entire CRM database. What we did was we wanted to give you representation of each of the three brands. So we sampled 14,000 customers randomly from among all North American customers who were active with that brand in the observation window. So active means they had one marketing contact or purchase between 1 July 2010 and 30 June 2012. Um, and this includes both users whose name and address was known, which is about 90% of the database, the data that you'll have, as well as users who are tracked by email address and web user ID only, that's about 10%. And then for those 42,000 customers, we basically got everything, every single customer event that any of those customers made with any of the brands. So if they were a multi-brand customer, you can see that as well, uh, between 1 July 2010 and 30 June 2012. So. Um, Skipping ahead, we're, I kind of organized, I'm going to spend some time now telling you about the data set in detail. Um, and I've organized it, I know the title of the talk was data on the four P's, but there's two sort of preliminary P's I need to tell you about first. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the people who are in the database and what we have on the purchases that they make. And then I'll talk to you about the four marketing P's, the place, we'll talk about physical and online stores, what we know about the product, there's incredibly rich data on the product here. We'll get to that soon. Um, what we know about the prices of those products and the promotions that were made for those products. Let me tell you a little bit about the people. You can see on the right, there's a detailed list. Those are all the fields that we have about the customers. So we know their age and gender, a bunch of other stuff that you can read there. The average age of these customers is about 40. But of course, we don't know the age of all of them um, because those are being kind of inferred in from credit card data and that kind of thing. Um, so, we, you know, there's a lot that we just don't know the age. 75% uh, are female, so I'll probably refer to the customers as her. 61% uh, have purchased brand A and 71% have purchased brand B. So you can see that, you know, of these, these 42,000 customers, there's lots of overlap. There's lots of customers who are purchasing both brand A and brand B. Um, brand C is a little bit smaller, so about 33% of this customer base is um, interacting, is, is having some kind of a relationship with brand C. Um, and then for brand A, which is the brand that has the loyalty program, so that's the only brand that has a loyalty program is brand A, 57.7% um, of those customers are, that are active with brand A are kind of in the loyalty program for brand A. Actually, I said that wrong. 57% of the 42,000 customers total are in the loyalty program. Of course, you'll be able to kind of work this all out once you have access to the data. We had another question come in, um, and that is, does the data have information on product returns? And in fact, it does. We'll get to that when we get to product. So um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the returns. But absolutely, we have records of the customer bought, and then she brought it back a little bit later. Um, a little bit more about the people. Um, so this slide, slide 10, I have some information with about how long these customers have been with the brand. Um, so the data includes the first purchase date for each brand, even if that date was outside of the observation window. So you can see, you get to see this customer's detailed activity for two years, but you can know whether or not the activity with the brand sort of started much earlier. So we have that first purchase date, and it's, it's because each brand is managed independently, we have that first purchase date for all three brands separately. Um, and you can see the tenure with the brand. There's a lot of variation there, so you'll, you'll have both new and old customers to see. Um, you can see that there's quite a few customers with brand A and brand uh, B that have been, with the, you know, been active customers for more than four years. Um, and, you know, it's really kind of remarkable that that uh, to the company's credit that they have such good tracking. Like a lot of companies couldn't tell you uh, what the sort of typical tenure is with the brand. Um, brand C, which is actually the brand that, that Jed and Sean work with, um, 
that's a newer brand. And so that brand has a relatively newer uh, customer base. So the brand hasn't been in existence as long as brand B and brand A. So there's some opportunities to kind of compare the dynamics between the different brands here. Um, to tell you a little bit about the purchases, so uh, on this slide 11, I have just a time series plot of the total number of purchases, net the returns, in the database. So you can kind of see by month uh, how much purchasing is being done. Um, and it should be pretty obvious just looking at the chart that this is a very seasonal product. <laughs> um, so uh, you can see it's that November, December time frame that this product sells a lot, not too surprising for a retailer. Um, and you can also see there's a substantial direct business. So they are primarily an in-store kind of company, but there's a, you know, a substantial amount of direct business. Um, and one last thing about the purchases, I just wanted to let you know exactly what we know about these purchases. So uh, here on slide 12, we have a list of um, basically all the data that's in the purchase. And I want to go through this because um, this is kind of the core of the database in my mind. Um, for each purchase, you'll know, of course, which brand it was, what the date was, what the channel was. And they, the company tends to sort of flag those as either direct or in-store, sort of lumping together the online and catalog um, business. The method of payment, and this is where the heart of the database is, to my mind, there's these, the products purchased, which are identified by the SKU. So you know the exact SKU that was purchased, um, how much was paid, whether it was returned, and where physically the store was that it was purchased. Um, over there on the right, I've given you a chart of the number of purchases that customers have made. So that's the histogram of number of purchases. I know the fonts are a little small. That last bin to the right is 16 or more purchases in the two-year observation window. So you can see there's a substantial block of customers that comes to the store regularly and makes purchases regularly. So there's huge opportunities to look at how customers are interacting with these brands over time. These are not, you know, you show up at the store once and buy it and never come in again. Um, there are a substantial number of customers who have sort of deep relationships with these brands. Um, we had a question come in uh, of whether or not customers are tracked across brands. Um, and, and this is really important. This is kind of a key thing about this data set that I think people need to understand. Um, the customers are tracked with every engagement that they have with the company. So if you're a customer of brand A and then you show up and you buy brand B, we, we match that back to brand A and we know that you're a customer that's engaging with both brands. But from a marketing action perspective, the, the brands are very independent. So there's this opportunity to see how a customer might be engaging with two brands that are being managed completely independently and differently but have this sort of natural crossover between them. This, this is kind of one of the really interesting potentials in this data set. Um, so that's it for people and purchases. So now I'm gonna really get into the four Ps that we had promised you. Um, so let me tell you first about place. So in the data set, I did say that the purchase details include the store location. So let me tell you a little bit more about what we know about each store physical location. Um, there's 300 plus physical stores represented in the data set. Uh, you can see the breakdown by brand. You can see that brand C has kind of a smaller footprint um, physically. Uh, so customers tend to be further away from brand C stores um, and maybe, maybe potentially more likely to look at uh, the direct channel. That's kind of one of the interesting opportunities here. Um, but we also know a lot about these physical stores. So um, the researchers will get access to the exact location of the store, um, so there's opportunities for geoanalytics here. Um, the company defined region district, so how the company kind of lumps the, the stores into regions. Um, when the store opened, when it closed, so is it a new store, an old store? Where the store sits physically, is it in a mall or on a city street? Kind of some just coding of, of what type of store it is, whether the weather there is hot or cold or whatever. Um, and then the store physical size. And just to give you a sense of that, um, there's a huge amount of variation in this data set on the size of the stores. So you can see brand C, that's Jed and Sean's brand. Those stores tend to be um, smaller stores and they have um, sort of fewer purchase occasions. So the, on the y-axis here, we have the number of purchases that have been serviced in that store. And on the x-axis, we have the, the size of the store. The orange brand, brand A, 
their um, stores are larger and fairly uniform in size, but very variable in how many purchases they're um, processing. And then this brand B is kind of really interesting. Um, so the stores vary a lot in their size, their physical size, and they also vary a lot in terms of how many purchases they're running, so um, running through those stores. So there's kind of an interesting opportunity here to look at how physical size of stores um, you know, affects purchase behavior. Um, you would be able to see whether customers are co-shopping two different stores within the same brand. Uh, so some of these stores would be in a metro area where you could potentially choose whether to go to the store in the suburbs or the store in the urban area. Kind of all of that is um, there for the, the taking for those of you who are really interested in, in physical channels. Um, here I've just, uh, on the, the bottom slides, and actually I should mention, um, since the fonts are small here, I know they might be hard to see on the webinar, all the slides and the detailed numbers will be you know, posted to uh, our website. So you'll be able to download a PDF of the slides and, and look at them a little closer. Um, here I've just given you histograms of the distance to the store, the nearest store. So you take a customer, where is her closest store for brand A? That's the first, um, the, a histogram of that across customers is the first panel on the left. Um, so you can see kind of modally, customers are about two miles from the store. Um, but you can see there's a long tail there, and there's a lot of customers who are very, very far away from the store. And this is true for all the brands. So there's some customers who live very close to their nearest store, and some customers who live quite far away from the store. Um, and so just kind of for people who want to understand and research more how customers choose between a physical location and an online location, um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity to kind of look at that and how that might vary depending on how far it is to drive to your nearest store. There's also a very interesting opportunity actually that, that Jed brought up early on when we were scoping out this project, which is um, he's working with this, this brand C that has the smaller footprint, and one of their questions is, do we need more physical stores? And can we leverage information from the direct channel to figure out store location problems? Like, can we figure out where to place stores based on um, where we have customers from the online channel? And that kind of begs all sorts of questions like, uh, is that just going to cannibalize sales off the offline on the online channel? If you build a store, does it just sort of is it just another way to service um, sales that you would have gotten anyway through the catalog and online, or does it actually produce incremental volume? So it's a really interesting uh, thing to ask about. A um, couple more questions. So let me stop for a minute. I'm going to sort of go off the four P's track and and handle these questions that are coming in. Um, one of the questions was, do we have any information on customer demographics? Um, we, other than age and gender, we do not. So, uh, and, and that's just a matter of, you know, a company wouldn't typically give someone a demographic questionnaire when they make their first purchase so that they can track those things over time. The, the data set really represents what the company kind of naturally has in the course of doing business. And I know that it is possible for companies to purchase, um, you know, inferred demographic data, some of which is geographically inferred. Um, and we kind of shied away from that for this data set. We really wanted to focus on what the company kind of collects about their customers in the normal course of doing business, rather than kind of some of this demographic stuff that uh, could be inferred incorrectly. Um, so, so the age and the gender um, come from other sources like uh, credit records that are, are fairly reliable. Um, so the gender listed on your credit record is usually pretty accurate. Um, whereas some of the other demographics like race might be inferred geographically and they can be fairly inaccurate. Um, uh, we have a couple questions about product coming up that I'll, I'll try to get to when we get to the product. Um, oh, Jed, did you have something to add about the, the demographics I see? Are you there, Jed? Yeah, hey, Ellie. Um, uh, we do have a PENS uh, data like you're mentioning, and, and I agree with you there. Like some of it is a little more reliable and some of it's a little less reliable. And so uh, if it's a, a big deal to somebody and they really want to see that, we could probably provide more. But uh, I uh, agree with uh, the principles you were stating earlier. Okay, great. And so um, the way to handle that type of thing is if having demographic appends, which would be 
uh, you know, data that isn't really com data that the company has in the natural course of doing business, but that they get from outside sources and append to the customer record. If getting more demographic appends like race is really important to you, put that in your proposal and we'll consider it. And, you know, at the time the company will also be considering, Jet will be considering whether they have the time and time available to kind of pull that data. I mean, those of you who saw that chart of the product sales should realize that Dead is getting ready to be very, very busy over the next couple of months. Um, and so that'll just be something that they have to consider whether they can, they have the bandwidth on their side to pull that kind of information. Um, let's see. Oh, uh, uh, the other thing on the appends that I wanted to mention was that we are providing geographic information about the customer. So if you want to infer demographics based on the geography yourself, um, that, that's also possible. So researchers that want to actually kind of do the inference about um, a customer based on their, uh, their home, their house location, uh, the data on the house location will be included in the data set. So I hope that makes sense. So you, you will have access to what the where the customer lives. And then if you need additional inferred demographic information, um, if that's really important to you, then put it into your proposal. All right. Let me move ahead to uh, the direct channel, which is kind of the other aspect of place. Um, so the direct channel, of course, provides an alternative channel that's accessible to anyone. No matter how far or near they are, they can call and, and get their order delivered to their house. Um, and like, unlike the physical stores, the really cool thing about the direct channel is that we know when store visits occur. <laughs> so people don't normally check in to a physical store. Um, but when they go to a web store, we get a complete record of that. So, and that is um, appended to the data set whenever possible. So if someone makes a web visit and identifies themselves by their email or whatever, that gets uh, appended to the customer's records that um, we know they made a visit to the website. So for instance, if the customer um, receives an email campaign and then follows the link in that campaign, then that can be tracked through that this was the email we sent, and then they followed the link, and this is the same customer now visiting the site. Um, and that just gives you a sense of the number of sessions. So the scale there is the company basically has about, for these customers, um, they're seeing about 25,000 sessions um, per month, or sorry, per week uh, over, over time. So you can see that in the data set. Um, let me tell you exactly what we know about the click stream. So, each online visit record includes the time and date of the visit, how many pages were viewed, how many products were viewed, so not just pages, but specific product pages, um, the full text of any on-site search they made. So if they came to the website and they searched for GIFs, um, that word would be recorded against the, uh, the visit. Um, how many items they placed in the cart during the visit, so were they like, putting a whole bunch of stuff in the cart, and then how many products were actually purchased um, during the visit. And just to kind of give you a sense of it, when people visit the site, they really visit the site. So you know, of course there are a lot of visits with just one page view, but there's a substantial number of visits with 10 page views and 50 page views. You can see the numbers up there. Um, with on-site product searches, with you know, product views, with lots of product views. So, so there is quite a lot of activity kind of going on in this clickstream data with the visit. So hopefully that answers the question that we had earlier about what we know about the visits. It's not the raw clickstream like every single click, because that would be just too much to keep in a CRM system like this. Um, but it has kind of a, a core, sort of core summary of each visit. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, and the, the, I didn't mention this on the slide, but you actually do know which specific um, SKU numbers were visited on the site. So you can tell that someone looked at a SKU and then didn't purchase it. Um, so another really interesting opportunity to kind of look at online shopping. Um, let me switch gears now and talk a little bit about the product data. Um, so uh, what the one most important thing you need to understand about this data set is that the product selection changes frequently. So the, this company is changing the set of SKUs that are available on a fairly regular basis. So we just took a handful of products here. So each row in this graphic represents the sales of one product by week. Um, and you can see that when it's white, that means that product just wasn't being sold at all in the store. So you can see 
that the, the products come online and then they're there for a few months and tend to go away. There's a few products that are there perennially in the database, you know, sort of perennial favorite products, but a big part of this company's business is deciding which products should be in the store next season. Um, and so we're encouraging research that looks at that and that we've provided a lot of rich, rich product detail um, so that people who want to look at that specific question of how should a retailer be thinking about and using past data to figure out what types of products should be offered next season, um, we're really encouraging research kind of of that flavor. Um, so uh, let me tell you the details we know about each product. I did tell you that we Every time a sale is made, we have a record of that that sale was made to this customer. Um, in addition, there's very rich data on those products. So, of course, you'd know the brand of the product. Um, but you also will get information on the product's position in a product hierarchy. So, typical product art hierarchy with divisions and departments and class and groups. Um, these are kind of different types of products as defined by the company. And so you'll know um, that that product was, you know, belong to kind of one of these groups. Um, you'll, there are some sets of products that are related, like things that would coordinate with each other, and those are identified as groups. And on top of that, the merchandisers have a whole bunch of sort of one-word tags that they can apply to the product, and all of those tags are available. So um, everything that the merchandiser kind of wanted to use to describe the product, like maybe sparkly or uh, you know, it's so a list of hundreds of words that the merchandiser might use to, to describe the product. Those tags um, are there as well. And on top of that, the vendor of the product. So it, it won't tell you exactly the name of the company that produced the product, but you will. they're identified by number. So these products came from the same vendor that we purchased them from, and these products came from a different vendor. Um, all of that's there. On top of that, there's a lot of information about how the product was displayed on the website. So the physical stores, we don't have a lot of information about like where was the product in the physical store. But in the online store, it's completely recorded where the product was in the CRM system. So we would know the category that the product was displayed on the website. So the website has a kind of typical retail website where there's a menu of different types of things that you can buy. And um, this tells you exactly which category this SKU was categorized under. Um, as well as the full text of the online product description is in the database. So if you want to do text mining related to, you know, what kind of text descriptions are related to, to products, um, uh, there, that's there as well. Uh, and then um, which was the first color of, you know, that was displayed online? So, you know, the, the product has, comes in multiple colors. Which one was the one that was displayed first in the photograph? Um, so, so that you could look at whether that, you know, makes a difference in terms of what is sold and, and you know, exactly how much of a difference does that make. Um, we also have information on how many times each product was viewed online. So uh, that data there for these 42,000 customers, how many times did they look? And, and we actually know at the customer level. So this customer looked at this particular product online. Um, we had a question come in that's kind of related to, uh, uh, the, the paper catalog, so the question is, are the paper catalog sends in the data set? And they are. So um, there's not a lot of information in the data set about what was in those catalogs, but the record that the catalog was sent um, is there. So those, those catalog sends are, are, are in the data set and tracked. Um, we have another question uh, related to product, and this is one I don't, I, I think the answer is no, but uh, I, I need to ask uh, Jed here, uh, or maybe Sean. So Jed, one of the researchers is asking whether or not product inventory information is available, so whether or not the total stock that's available of the product is, is in the data set. I haven't, I mean, we cert it's not certainly in the data set that we're planning to distribute, but do you have that information even? Yeah, so it's yeah, it's definitely not in the data set that we've provided um, so far. We have inventory information. I think we'd want to see 
um, uh, again, kind of a description of, of what the, the, the use is for the inventory information. It's, um, it's something that we're getting better at tracking, but, uh, and even our history would be um, fairly reliable. We just want to know kind of exactly what we're, um, what, what we're looking at providing. Just We have a couple different sources for it, and I'd want to just know the right place to, to look for it. But uh, it's one that, again, would be really helpful if we just kind of understood what the, the reasoning was and we could get to the right piece of data. Um, and when we get to price, actually, uh, let me hold off that. I'll bring this up again. If, remind me, Sean, if I forget, that there's a reason why inventory might not be that interesting, but I'll, I'll get to that when I get to the price slide. Um, another question, since I've got you, Sean, uh, that um, one of the researchers has typed in is, are the products launched at the same time in stores and online? Um, not necessarily. Okay, so they might be, and you'd be able to, um, we don't have the actual product launch dates in the data set, but you can see, you know, when customers started buying it, and that's a pretty... You can definitely infer them, yeah. Yeah. All right, um, so uh, moving on to the online reviews. We had mentioned early on that we have the online reviews. Let me explain exactly the, the detail of that. Um, so the website has typical online reviews. You give a star rating, and you type something about the product. Uh, this is just an example of an online review. That isn't the actual company's website. Um, so for the products that are sold online, so there are some products that are only sold in store, and of course there would be no online reviews for products that are only sold in stores. But for the products that are sold online, the data includes the average user rating. So every single product gives you the average user rating, and that's the average for the all customers, not just our 42,000 in the sample. Um, but the really cool thing here is that we have the full text of reviews for those customers who were included in the sample. So if one of the 42,000 customers wrote a review and identified herself when she wrote that review, then that review is appended to her customer record and it's there that she wrote the review. Um, so I think there's a very interesting opportunity to look not at how reading a review affects sales, but how writing review affects your long-term relationship with the product. I, I think there's kind of a really cool opportunity there. Um, as an aside, I know some of you are very interested in online reviews. Um, we are going to have another webinar, I'll tell you at the end, coming up that will delve even more deeply into online reviews. In this case, it's something that the company um, that's sponsoring this CRM data set is very interested in, but we wanted to focus on kind of the relationship between the online reviews and the, and the CRM system. And, and so this isn't sort of a pure play research opportunity about online reviews. It's just that online reviews are a natural part of the sort of 360 view of the customer that we have. Um, next, I'd like to talk a little bit about price. Um, so I've taken a handful of products here and showed you what their price was. So their average monthly price per item sold for you know, a handful of different SKUs. And the first thing you notice is there's no price discounting going on. So this company just doesn't practice regular price promotions. It's not a part of their, their toolkit. Um, and so uh, anyway, that it's basically, you know, fairly flat in price, and to the, the person's question about whether or not we had inventory data, um, when, you, when you look at inventory, I'm sure you're sort of thinking about the company's discounting practices, and this is a case where the, the company just doesn't, isn't practicing discount to try to move inventory. Um, I actually wanted to ask Jed, since I was here, um, so Jed, uh, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about why the company doesn't practice regular price promotion, sort of what the, is this, well, the question I wanted to ask you is, is this like an everyday low price kind of philosophy, or what is sort of driving the fact that the company doesn't do price promotion? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, really quickly, I, I think it's, it's not an everyday low price thing, it's more analogous to the premier product uh, concept and that we really uh, believe that across the brands we're offering something that's unique and worthy of a higher price point. Uh, and, and that uh, in addition to that, getting into the habit of discounting may dilute the brand uh, wealth a little bit. So uh, uh, okay. just given our, uh, our, our history, it's been something that we haven't really practiced. It's really about keeping it as a premium brand and, and not having those sort of discounting as part of what the brand philosophy is about. You got it. Okay. Um, while I've got you, another question about prices. Um, uh, and, and I'm sure you're kind of in the thick of the action on this. 
um, the, the channels, do the channels operate independently or do you manage both channels? Do you set the prices essentially on both channels? Price, uh, pricing across the channels can be different uh, between retail and direct. Uh, and then uh, direct and catalog would be the same. Okay, so the, the, the online and the catalog are kind of treated as one, but then the stores can vary a little bit from that. But it's not, it's not like the direct channel is managed like as a completely independent entity. You're still involved in the marketing for both, right? Correct, yeah. Marketing uh, and, and other functions support both, but uh, that is where we kind of can practice some price, pricing uh, discrimination. Okay. Um, that makes a lot of sense. I may have confused people. I keep saying that the brands are managed independently, and that is true. The brands are managed independently. The channels are not. So the channels are coordinated, but there is an opportunity to kind of do some different things across the two channels. Um, another question came up for you, Judd. Um, do you have a social network presence? Uh, yeah, personally I do, but I uh, like to keep the wraps on it. Just kidding. Um, yes, we do have a social network presence. Uh, each of the brands uh, invests significantly in uh, maintaining that and really building close relationships with our customers. Um, in terms of the data that we have, uh, it's a little bit uh, more challenging to get the uh, data about your social followers unless you've integrated uh, with like something like Facebook Connect, and, and so we're not providing that. Okay, so you, you're not providing data on what the, you know, th that this customer posted something on your uh, Facebook page that's not available. Right, this is Sean. One thing that's in the, um, the web visit data that you'll see is, uh, you know, obviously we're not tracking, uh, as Jed said, we're not tracking that activity that's off of our site actually on the channels, but um, uh, anyone that directly interacts with, uh, with any social channels will see, you know, you'll see that they've, that they've come from those channels when they hit uh, any of the sites and that, that okay. sort of information is so available in the, had, in the web I'm visit data. If I on Facebook and then I follow a link onto the website, from Facebook, that'll be logged on the web visit log. Correct. Oh, okay, great, great. So that's some way to kind of back. You could back out at least at some some of the users were. Right. You get you get some subset of followers. Um, you know, definitely implied followers, but uh, some subset of them that are that are active and in, in, you know directly engaging with the. With that are the, engaging yep. with the yep. Facebook content. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for clarifying that. All right. So we talked a little bit about price, and the company is not a. Um, Price-promoting company. Um, Ellie, a, yeah, can, can we take that next question too? Um, oh, sure. The one that's number fifty. Yeah. Go for it. Uh, so um, within oh, the brands. Oh, yeah. There was a question around are the channels managed together or not, and is that within brands or across brands? The brands are managed independently, and then within each brand, the channels and uh, marketing for the channels is managed together. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. And then, then the marketing communication would be coordinated across channels. So that like Correct. The images and the style of the marketing communication that you'd see in a physical store is going to look and feel the same as what you'd see on the web or in a catalog. Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. And the same, the same products may or may not be promoted. Like if something's on the cover of the catalog, is it also going to be at the front of the store? Uh, it may be, and a little bit of that, again, goes back to the question of timing and does the product arrive online and in catalog at the same time that it arrives in retail? And in many cases, that's not always true. So a product featured on the cover of a catalog would probably get a prominent placement on the website on that day the catalog drops, but might not be in the stores until a week or two weeks afterwards. And then at that point, it, it may very well take a front table in the store. Okay, but it's but you as the the head of marketing for brand C coordinate all of that in partnership with the planning teams uh, and the merchandising teams. Yeah. Okay. All right. But it everybody's sort of thinking about how that's all going to work together. Correct. Exactly. Okay. Great. Um, so let me talk a little bit about. Um, oh, we, we have another question related to that. So I'll read that one for you, Jed. Are the channels? separate profit cost centers? For instance, if one buys online and returns offline, does the offline store get mad about that? <laughs> that yeah, I'm just thinking that, through uh, you know, a quick and short answer. And um, historically, yes. Uh, potentially moving forward, uh, no. 
Okay. So, so things are starting to line up and we're really starting to think, uh, I almost hate to use this buzzword, but omni-channel as opposed to retail versus direct. Great. Okay. All right. Um, so wrapping up with the last P, so promotions. Um, so the retailer promotes its stores and products primarily through direct marketing. So there's not a ton of mass media going on, so you can actually track a lot of the marketing activity at the individual level. Um, there's some mass media, but just not, not a, a ton of that. Um, and the really interesting thing I think about this, if you're interested in advertising, this is pure advertising. This is not, there's no price promotion going on for the most part. So most of the advertising is designed to get you excited about the products or remind you to go to the store, but it's all kind of pure advertising effect, and you don't have to worry about separating out that price effect from the advertising effect. Um, so it's kind of an interesting opportunity from a research perspective for that reason. Um, and for each customer, we'll observe exactly when each direct contact occurred, so the date the email was sent out, the date the catalog shipped, you know, all those are tracked at the individual level. So this customer received this catalog on this date. Um, you'll know what the channel is, uh, is, of course, and for email you get opens and the, the kind of response to the email that you typically get with email data. And then there is a description of the campaign. That's not like coded out, but there is a text description of what the, the campaign was. Um, so, uh, and there's plenty of these marketing touches, especially with email. You know, email is, is on a fairly regular basis. So you can kind of see how people are interacting over time. All right, uh, so we had a little bit of time set for Q&A. We've kind of been taking questions as we go, so there's not really any questions in the queue. Um, so I wanted to wrap things up. Uh, hopefully you've been thinking about, like, the, the literally dozens of potential research projects that are kind of sitting in this data set. Um, but I wanted to finish things off by um, talking a little bit about what the company is really interested in. Um, you know, of course, when we review the proposals, the company is involved in reviewing those proposals. Uh, and so, you know, they're going to look favorably on the ones that uh, answer questions that are of key business importance to them. Um, just so everyone understands, when we evaluate proposals, we kind of look for both academic contributions. So we want to see a proposal that tells us that you're going to do something that's novel and interesting from the academic perspective. But we also, <laughs> at the same level, want um, research proposals that truly um, provide business value to the company. And you can certainly answer questions that weren't on the company's list, but you need to make the case that having the answer to this question or having this new tool is going to be valuable to, to the company. And hopefully through the webinar you've kind of gotten a sense of the company and, and what sorts of things that they're interested in. But I just wanted to lay out their, their research questions. These were actually uh, written by them. Um, so the first question is just about multi-channel, multi-brand advertising. Um, do online and offline marketing communications affect both offline and online sales? Kind of we have all the data. Um, and one of the things they're really interested in, what is the role of outbound marketing for a non-promotional brand? So if you have a brand that isn't doing a lot of price discounting, you don't need to communicate those price discounts. So, you know, what is, you know, how should advertising be used by a company like that? Um, Going on to the next research question, as I, as I pointed out as we were going through, there's a huge opportunity to look at the relationship between product attributes and sales. Um, and, you know, from the business's point of view, can product information be used to predict what individual customers will buy next, or maybe even to make recommendations to individual customers? Like, is there an opportunity here to figure out um, what should be in the email that goes to Ellie Fight exactly? Uh, you know, which category should you be promoting to her, et cetera? Um, next question is, how can this CRM type data be able to quantify the, the retail saturation and the cross-channel cross cannibalization? So this gets to this point of where should the stores be? Are the stores stealing from each other, individual retail stores? Are the, the retail stores stealing from the direct channel? Kind of what's, what, what's all kind of going on in that space? Um, what effect do loyalty programs have on subsequent purchase behavior? So you have this interesting opportunity that just Brand A has a loyalty program. Um, I can't remember. Maybe Sean knows. Loyal, the loyalty program for Brand A, that program was launched before our observation window, right? Yes. Yeah, so you, the, it, a few years before the observation window, this, this company started this loyalty program. So you can kind of look at the variation between 
the brand that has the loyalty program and the brands that don't have the loyalty program and, and is that a value? I'm sure Jed would like to know because he's managing one of the brands that doesn't have a loyalty program yet and would love to know exactly um, how much would it gain him if he invested in putting that loyalty program together. Um, of course, they'd like to know how uh, this type of CRM data could be used to predict customer lifetime value, and they'd love to be able to score each customer and say this is what she's likely to purchase in the future um, so that they can you know, treat their better customers um, better. Uh, and how should online and catalog uh, buying behavior be used to identify new potential physical store locations? We talked a little bit about that as we went through. Um, be great to kind of come up with a new way of figuring out where to launch a store. Um, and then uh, kind of last but not least, are there customers who are trendsetters who can be used to identify what to sell next? So is there a way you could find a group of sort of trendsetter customers in this database uh, that what they buy, people buy, other people are likely to buy next um, and use those people to help drive the, the merchandising strategy for figuring out what's the set of products we should be selling next season. Um, I wanted to point out that these questions uh, were not in any particular order. And as I said, we're open to proposals that answer different questions, but I just wanted to give you a feel for kind of the types of things that the company was interested in. If you have some other interesting idea, feel free to, to write it up in the proposal and uh, you know, make, make the case that it's academically interesting and, and valuable to the, the company who's providing the data, and uh, we'll take a look at it. Um, as far as submitting a proposal, uh, like I said, we like to keep the proposal process short and sweet. Um, they should be no more than 2,000 words, and we um, are getting a little bit more formal now that we're on to our seventh webinar with the format of the proposal, so um, make sure you kind of have all these sections included in the proposal. So we want a title, um, we need your name and email address, and we, we really need a corresponding author. If you don't give us a corresponding author, we won't know who to write to. An abstract, an introduction. Um, in the introduction, we're looking to just explain to us what you're trying to do, covering both those academic and practical aspects. Keep it concise. You can put citations in there, but there's no need for like a lengthy literature review. Um, if you use sites to explain what your con academic contribution is, but, but don't feel the need for a two-page lit review. Um, and then we like a detailed pro project proposal. If it's a modeling project, give us a sketch of the model, a couple equations. Make sure we understand kind of um, what you're trying to do with that. If it's an experimental project, um, you know, give us a sense of the research design, um, and then also let us know roughly how long you think the project will take. And then you can wrap it up with some, some biographies explaining uh, what, what each of you contribute to the product, project. Sorry. Um, so short and sweet. Um, you can read more about the proposal format at the link that I'm giving at you at the top of slide 28. Proposals will be due October 18th, so that's a little more than three weeks from now. Um, or sorry, exactly three weeks from now. And I'm very proud to announce the latest innovation at WCAI is we have a form, a web form, where you submit your proposal. So uh, you want to go onto that proposal site and um, upload your proposal. It's really easy to do. Um, but if you, I, I'm actually going to uh, be out of the country when proposals are due. So if you email it to me personally, it may not get into the pile. So please make sure that you submit your proposals online. Um, and if you do send it to me and I notice it, I'm going to send it back and say, please submit it online. So just not go through that process. Uh, the proposals will be evaluated by uh, Eric Bradlow, Pete Fader, myself, and Jed, and Sean, and a couple other people from the company. Um, and if you have any questions, so at this point, um, if you have any questions, like you get to looking at the webinar and you're thinking about your project and you think, oh, I wonder if they have this field, feel free to send an email to WCAI Research. We'll be monitoring that like up until the 18th. Um, and we try to get back to you within a couple days with um, some information. Uh, the other thing that can happen is you wonder whether or not a particular field that I've described here is variable enough for you to actually estimate a model against it. Um, you know, let me know what you're looking for, and I can send you histograms or kind of rough visualizations of the data to try to try to answer that question for you. So feel free, um, you know, don't hesitate to email that uh, with questions about the data. Now, if you have questions about your proposal, I, I can't help you there. But if you want to know what specifically is in the data, um, 
that would be, uh, you know, more than happy to have you send it to that state. Um, the other thing I should remind you guys of uh, is um, we, ha we actually had a question come in of whether or not the company has a deadline for project completion. Um, there is sort of a deadline. Uh, we will be getting together next September um, here in Philadelphia and hosting a symposium where you will be asked to come and present your research. Now, we all at WCII, we're all researchers ourselves, we understand there's risk, there's hiccups, things don't always work out the way you had hoped, um, but what we really want is for you to show up in September and tell us where you are. Um, typically, uh, we'll have a couple of teams that have a working paper by then, so that's what you should strive for. Um, and if you don't think, you know, if you're going to be on, on vacation for the next 12 months, definitely don't submit a proposal. Uh, that wouldn't be a good, good situation. Um, but so we'd, we'd like to see a working paper about a year from now. If that can't happen, we, you know, just come with a presentation and show us kind of where things are. Um, we typically, most of the projects will have working papers within a few months, either before or after the symposium. That's kind of par for the course. So. Um, there's no official deadline, but we, we want you to come in September and, and show us where you are. Um, I should mention uh, that uh, um, it, we'd love to have insights along the way. So let me explain what happens after you submit the proposal. Um, when you submit your proposal, we'll award, you, know, you, get, you get the data award. Um, you do sign a data sharing agreement that gives you license to use the data for scholarly research. Um, as soon as we get that agreement back, we'll send you a link to download the data. About a month after that, we have a conference call. Jed will be on, Sean will be on, Hari will be on. As you get into kind of all the questions that you have, get the files open, figure out what's going on, um, we'll have a conference call where you can ask them questions like, what does this mean? You know, there's this customer did this one thing that didn't make any sense. What's that all about? Um, so that's at the one month. At the six month point, we like to have you show up with like just one slide on kind of where things are. Um, so any early insights you have, any puzzles that you've run into where you're getting results that don't make sense, that you want to run by the company. So you'll, you'll be able to interact with them through that. And of course, um, any time along the way, you can send us an email and we can send results on to the company. So they, they would more than love to kind of react to early results if you have them. Um, then at the end of the 12 months, you'll show up here for the symposium. And then after that, we'll start sort of tracking, looking for a working paper, um, et cetera. A uh, couple more, uh, that, I think that handles it for the process. A couple more factual questions came in. Um, does the company do any uh, personalization in the email campaign? Maybe, Sean, you can answer to that. When you send emails, are they targeted, or do you blanket the list that you have? Um, yes, I think there, there's, two, there's two things there. Um, you know, it was asked as personalization, but I think uh, what we're actually getting at is, is segmentation from our perspective. Um, and so that will definitely happen. It will happen to a varying degree across the brands. Um, and uh, that should be apparent in, in the contact data um, that they receive. Uh, okay. because, because you'll see you know, this campaign occurred and it either, it either included everyone or included only a, a portion of, uh, of the people that are in the data set. Um, as far as personalization, uh, that does you know, take place within the actual campaigns, but that's not something that would be visible in this data set. Okay. So there, there may be some customization of the content of the email that you yeah, um, in the data set. Yeah, infrequent, and uh, each of the brands is relatively consistent with its consistent with its infrequent use. So that it sh it shouldn't uh, it shouldn't throw anything off too much in terms of uh, performance. Okay, makes sense. All right, uh, just to um, uh, remind you of kind of upcoming stuff. I said we're currently planning six additional webinars kind of over the next 12 months. Um, so if you registered for this webinar, you're on our mailing list now, and you will receive rev regular announcements about these. Um, so we have one coming up on smart meter data, so the actually energy consumption data, another one on loyalty use for a, a travel company. As I mentioned during the webinar, we have an online ratings data set coming up. Um, and then General Motors is uh, going to be sponsoring one in February of next year. A few more kind of in the early planning stages, so lots coming. Um, for those of you who are waiting for the gaming data set, that's still on the books, but there's been some hiccups. So um, if you're really interested in the gaming data, drop me an email, and I'll, I'll let you know more what, what's going on there. But it, it's in the planning works, but uh, uh, just a few hiccups there. 
Um, and uh, you can also check out our working paper series on SSRN. The link is there. And then all of our announcements get posted to our website. Um, so feel free to check all that out. Um, that's it that I had for today. Um, thank you so much for, for joining today. And I look forward to reading all of your proposals. Thanks a lot.